the truth of scripture, individuals are not going to comprehend and know why they're doing certain things. Um, uh, so the first thing is teach the truth of scripture. This is how you kind of give people more confidence in the word of God. Cause the more you understand something, the more you're able to kind of live up to its standards or live in a way that is in, in step with Christ. Man, welcome you guys to the daily thinker podcast. I have an exciting, exciting episode this time and it's kind of ironic that we tackling this topic right now because it seems like in the next two days everybody will have fourteen hundred dollars in their <laughs> account because of the stimulus check and not just that we got tax time coming around so hey this topic i feel like is important right now and it's always important not just during this season tax time it's stimulus time since we living in a pandemic we got stimulus time now but i have soc on the show if you don't know this man this man is brilliant, okay? He knows the word. He will break down the word righteously and divide it correctly. So that's why I had to get this man on to talk about the tide, okay? To talk about the tide. SOC is a beast. I mean, he's been killing it. I mean, you need to check out his YouTube channel. His videos are amazing. Also, he has a separate YouTube channel where he does movie reviews. So if you like movies, me too much. I don't watch too many movies, but I like watching movie reviews for some reason. It doesn't make no sense at all. But it's, I don't know why I like that. But I definitely love his channel. So enough of my talking. Let me introduce the brilliant, the excellent. Oh, my goodness. The magnificent. SOC. SOC, how you doing, man? Too much pressure, man. Too much pressure. <laughs> now, I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm glad to be on the show. Yeah, we glad to have you on the show, man. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. People who don't know you, what you do, and why you started this um, YouTube channel that you have now that's doing really, really good. Uh, well, um, I was born in New York City. I uh, lived in the Bronx, moved over to Atlanta, uh, finished high school here, and went to college here and became an occupational therapist. I currently um, am doing that and also my YouTube channel, but I was what really motivated me to kind of complete my YouTube channel or to start it, uh, should I say, is because of the background I came from. I used to be part of the black Hebrew Israelites. And after leaving that cult, um, I had to struggle with my faith. I had to figure out whether I, you know, whether God loved me or not and had to really struggle. And one of the things that I asked the Lord during that time was, Lord, please show me who you are according to your word, without people telling me who you are. And as a result, I started studying and learning a lot of, about what I used to believe was wrong and what I'm currently believing is more accurate and lines up with the word of God. And so this is why I take the word of God seriously and trying to understand it and then make it easy for other people to understand. And so that's what motivated me beginning this Servant of Christ Ministries YouTube channel. Awesome. Amazing. You really do make it extremely simple on all your videos. But you said you was a Hebrew Israelite, ex-Hebrew yeah. Israelite. So I'm going to ask you this. The <laughs> best three things about a Israel, being an Israelite and the not so best three things about being an Israelite. Well, OK, so this is interesting. So before I became a Hebrew Israelite, I really didn't study the Bible at all. My, my family came from a predominantly Catholic background. But more, more, more or less like we're, we were culturally Catholic, not that we studied and practiced or anything like that. Um, when I became a Hebrew Israelite, it was the first time we had ever studied the Bible at all. So I guess the positive thing was I actually we were able to open a Bible. Uh, the second positive thing was we had a community of individuals that surrounded us um, and tried to help us understand the Bible. Um, I can't think of another positive, <laughs> to be completely honest, um, other than community and just opening the Bible for the first time. Uh, the negative things were when we did open the Bible, it was taught through a like a rose colored lens. Basically, it was presuppositions. It was beliefs that they had prior and then they tried to inject it into the text. So everything that we were learning from scripture, we weren't really learning from scripture. We were learning from other people's perspectives of what scripture said. Uh, the second thing is uh, one of the, the negatives is if you leave the community, you don't have anybody to be on your side. You're kind of alone uh, because when you leave that religious background um, with certain groups, depending on which group you're a part of, there's so many different uh, kind of sections of those of the black Hebrew Israelites. But from when I when I left, I actually had to have no relationship with my mother for about 15 years. Um, I didn't see her, didn't watch my sisters grow up because it was seen as if she would have a relationship with me. She was pretty much disrespecting God. Um, 
so when that happened, that was rough. Uh, and then afterwards, um, uh, I guess one of the other, the other negatives is I had a fear of God, not understanding who he was. It was because I was built up as a, basically a legalist. If I didn't do these certain commands and I didn't do them correctly, especially dealing with the old covenant in the old Testament, then I wasn't measuring up to God's standard and God didn't love me. But when I did so-called try to keep the law, then I would think that God loved me. So it was always this give and take, but a very bad understanding of who Christ was. And that's pretty much in a nutshell about kind of like the three positives and negatives. Wow. You, something that um struck me when you said that you said you had to like abandon your relationship with your mother, like after you mm-hmm. left being a Hebrew Israelite. So you have to like abandon Christ. I mean, not abandon Christ, ab- abandon your family. Mm-hmm. Christ. I mean, dang, that's serious right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is from their perspective, this is what makes it difficult from their perspective. They're doing the right thing by pushing me away because, you know, they'll use scriptures like, hey, we're supposed to, you know, not, you know, uh, associate with a believer who you know, is, is contrary to the word of God. But it wasn't contrary to the word of God. It was contrary to their understanding of the word of God. And because they had a distorted understanding when I left, they perceived me to be the heretic which is interesting because their beliefs are heretical to scripture. And so when I left, you know, and then I became a Christian, which is probably the ultimate no, no in the Hebrew Israelites. Um, then this, when I became like, you know, the, the castaway. And so my mother wasn't allowed, even though she'll say, Oh, well, you know, I wasn't forced, but based on the way that they were teaching the scriptures, her idea was that if she associated with me, it was like, she was condoning my, my heresy of the black Hebrew Israelites. So she, we, we didn't even see each other for about 15 years. Didn't see my, like I said, I didn't see my sisters grow up or anything like that. So that was really difficult. Wow. That is wild. I might have to get you back on to talk about Hebrew Israelism just for one topic <laughs> alone. Cause I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I do want to go into the topic that we're talking about today. We're going to talk about the tithe is tight and biblical. Should we do it? Should we not do it? Should we give 10%, 20%, 30, 50? I don't know. What should we be doing with this tithe? So before we start, can you just break down like what a tithe is? Okay, so if we're going to kind of break down what tithing is, we have to understand what the word is, right? You know, the Hebrew word, it just means 10th. That's all the word tithe means. It's not attached to anything specifically. And so the word tithe is just mean 10% of something. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of people tie it to uh, the old law and try to impose it or superimpose it into the New Testament or under the new covenant. And that's not the case. It shouldn't be translated that way. But if we're looking at the Old Testament, the way tithing worked in the Old Testament, it was specifically dealing with the, the animals and the, and the, uh, the crops, that's what tithing was dealing with specifically. And so if we're looking at it from old Testament standard, it is dealing specifically with, um, crops and animals, uh, not dealing with money at all. So that's in in a nutshell. I mean, you know, before we start unpacking all of this, that's kind of like a good overall general sense of what tithing is according to the old covenant. Okay. And we have a different look on it now. Like when we say tithe, we think about money and that is it. So what isn't a tithe? So if you were having a conversation with somebody and you were saying, and it was, you know what, you don't give your 10% or you don't give money to your local church. So you are not tithing. So what is not a tithe? Okay. So like, what is not a tithe? Well, a tithe is not money. Okay, so if an individual tells you you have to give 10 percent of your money to the church as a mandate, then that means it's that's incorrect. Right. Because tithing, according to the old covenant, tithing only apply to animals and crops. So when it talks about the New Testament, now it's offering is a free will offering you give as you are led in your heart to give. Like, for example, um, I'm trying to pull up the scripture for you now, just because I think it's important to go through the text. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, it says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So just that text alone, if you were to say, "Okay, we're mandated to give 10 percent. So then why does the scripture say you must each decide in your heart how much to give? You see what I'm saying? So if you're if you're if you're deciding how much to give, then that means that there's not a mandated 10 percent. Also, it also means uh, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. In other words, don't let anybody else pressure you into feeling you have to give a certain percentage. But the decision is between you and the Lord on how much you give. Right. So I guess that's it, y'all. So that's it for the show. (laughs) I mean, he just explained it right there. You don't need to watch no more. I'm just (laughs) 
<laughs> For real. Um, so the thing is, when you start to make these claims, when you start to say, when you start to say what you're saying, like give um give what you what your heart desires to give. Mm-hmm. But then when you say that, the common I mean, I know a lot of people seeing this preach in their church, you know. If mm-hmm. you don't give, you will be cursed. If you don't give, you will be cursed by God. And that has right. drove so many people into fear of leaving the church and also just shaming the church, saying that's why people, a lot of people don't want to associate with the church. You know what? They said, I'm going to be cursed if I don't give to this um, building or give to this mm-hmm. man or give to. It's almost like giving to like a priest in some sense where, you know, some people do actually give to a priest. So how can we how can we navigate through that? Those people who say that you will be cursed, like let's deal with that scripture. Okay. So we want to deal with Malachi chapter three, right? We want to go to Malachi chapter three and we want to talk about it. Okay, cool. So when you go to Malachi chapter three, um, interestingly enough, uh, yesterday we started the series of Malachi chapter one, going through it verse by verse. And we're going to go to Malachi chapter two, three, and four in the, on, on the YouTube channel on Saturday night live. So at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if you guys have an opportunity, go ahead and jump on there because we're walking through the entire chapter, the entire book, verse by verse. But dealing specifically with Malachi chapter three, which is usually the scripture that's brought to the forefront as a way to try to convict individuals to give. And if they don't give, they're robbing God. So in Malachi chapter three, right, verses seven through 11, I'll read it and then we'll kind of talk about the points here. It says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? Uh, Some some translations will say offerings. Uh, Verse nine says, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail uh, to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so that portion of scripture is usually the thing that's brought to the forefront, but unfortunately, it's never brought with context. Okay, so Malachi chapter one and Malachi chapter two is dealing specifically with the priests and the children of Israel. So understanding the dialogue, there is a a kind of back and forth going on the way Malachi kind of expounds on this book. And he uses a rhetorical conversation. Right. God says something, then Israel says something. And so here uh, we begin with the conversation. It says, will a man rob God? So the question I think people should ask themselves is. How is a person going to rob God? Now, is this text saying that we can go up to heaven and take something from God? No, that's not what it's saying. (laughs) He says, yet you are robbing me. And then it says, how have we robbed you? So that's the conversation. So how are we robbing God? So he gives two reasons and two ways that they're robbing him. Uh, One, he says, in your tithes and contributions. So notice that they are two separate things. Notice that the contributions of the offerings are not tied to the tithe. They're not the same thing. This is why he makes a distinction or a delineation between the two. And so what tithes are, according to the Bible, is the crops and the animals and the offerings and the sacrifices that came from those specific things. And the tithes, we're dealing with 10% of that. The offerings and the contributions had to do with things like the the census tax that was collected in Israel or the money that was collected for the contributions to the temple and and taking in the upkeep of the temple. But the contributions did something. And I think that's what a lot of people miss is that they think contributions and ties just go together. The contributions, if we read up earlier in Malachi chapter three and we read verse five, we see what the contributions were meant to do. Right. So in verse five of Malachi chapter three, it says, then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely. And then pay attention to what he does here against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me. So the contributions were meant to take care of the people of Israel and those who would come into Jerusalem or into where Israel was dwelling. And that's what the contributions were for. So again, these tithes, there's two things here. So now verse nine, he says, 
You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with individuals using this verse to say, oh, well, you see, if you don't give money to the church, then you're cursed. Right. But that's not what he's not. That's not what he's dealing with here. Um, uh, one of the things I definitely want to touch on is this this idea of what's the curse that he's dealing with. And I think even before we get into that, I think it'll be important for us to kind of like go through what the, the different forms of tithing are. And I think it'll expound on it better there. Is, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I think we definitely need, you definitely need to dive into that. Dive into that because <laughs> a lot of people don't want to talk about that. They want to go gloss over that and they want to go talk about you're robbing God. And they use the parallel of Christ in the Christ in the church. And Christ is the, the bride. Is, the bride is the church for Christ. And so how are you not giving to Christ's bride? So actually you're robbing Christ. I don't know. If mm-hmm. you Actually, have you heard that before? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, individuals, that's the problem is that right. they take an Old Testament text and they superimpose the new covenant and the New Testament Christians into that text. And this is why it's important to read uh, the scriptures in context, right. because if you just put yourself in the scripture every single time and not read it for what it's saying and understanding the cultural context and how it was stated, then you're going to run into a whole bunch of problems. And this uh, kind of doctrine is just one of those issues. Right. It's going to turn into meology. Instead of- right. <laughs> so if you could just dive into that. Okay. So one of the things we got to think about is what are the different forms of tithing? So uh, again, the book of Malachi is dealing specifically with the children of Israel. This is not dealing with the other nations. This is not dealing with America today. This is not dealing with anything that's happening right now. It's dealing specifically with the children of Israel. Another thing to understand is this idea of a contract, right? The contract, if like, for example, if me and you make a contract, if you disobey the contract, your family members are not going to be punished because the contract is between you and I. You know what I mean? So if the contract is between Israel and God, that means anybody after that is not going to be affected except for the children of Israel and God, right? Those who are keeping the contract. So I think that the idea here is to kind of walk along the lines of what are the different forms of tithing. So one of the ways uh, that God required 10% the tithe was of land, basically the crops that grew. And uh, the passage that you would go to would be uh, Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. And he says, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So he's asking for 10 percent of the crops that grow. That's what God is asking for. That's what tithing is being applied to. But then we also had animals. Animals animals were also part of that tenth. And if you go to Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 32, it states, and concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. So now we see that the 10th or the tithe is being applied to both the animals and the land or the crops. So, so far, no money has been involved. The 10% is dealing specifically with those things. So now what were the tithes for? Was it that he just wanted to randomly collect money, collect uh, uh, animals and, 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 um, and food? No, it was for a specific reason. Right. So when you go to numbers, right, chapter uh, eight, numbers, chapter 18 and verse 21, we have an idea what the tithes were for. Right. So it says, behold, I have given the children of Levi. Notice that it's the tithes are being given to the children of Levi, the Levitical priesthood. He says, behold, I have given the uh, the uh, behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting. So now the land and the crops and the animals, how people ate and took care of themselves. These things were given to the Levites. Now the reason it was given to the Levites, because number one, they were performing the work in the temple. They were taking care of the work, sacrificing the animals, doing all that work. Also, when you read in the old Testament, you discover that a lot of the, um, actually all of the nation of all of uh, Levi, the tribe of Levi, they didn't inherit any land. Because their job was specifically to deal with the things of the priestly household. So what does that mean? Well, it means specifically that they weren't going to be able to go and work. They didn't have land to grow crops and food. So what did God do? Well, he provided, he took 10% from all of Israel who were given lands. And they took those, that 10% and brought it to the Levites. So they would have enough food to eat and to take care of the necessities as far as food and things like that. Now, Some people will talk about like, well, 
can a contribution like remember when in Malachi where we read about uh, uh, how have you how have we robbed you? It says in tithes and offerings. So can an offering be money? Yes, but an offering can also be food as well. Okay, so let me give you an example. In um, in Exodus chapter thirty, verses twelve to thirteen, it states, "When you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life." Um, and to the Lord, when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in this census shall give this half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. So here we, we, we figure out that, wait a minute, this is an offering and this is a contribution, but it's a census tax for of the children of Israel. But notice Nowhere in the text did he say that it was 10%. The, the, the amount is actually given a shekel according to the household or half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Um, so, you know, if we go through Deuteronomy chapter 14, I think this will be another one that we can actually expound on. What do you think? You think we should go into Deuteronomy 14 just to kind of uh, expound on these uh, other points? Absolutely. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. So Deuteronomy 14 verses 22 to 27 actually describe the tithe. Like, so what will happen is individuals will take certain passages and try to kind of magnify them and say, look, it's, it's only about money. So Deuteronomy 14 verses 22 to 27 states, you shall, you shall truly tithe of all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. So notice the 10th or the tithe is immediately attached to field and grain, things that were produced and, um, and they were supposed to um, tithe of that. Verse 23 says, and you shall eat before the Lord. So here in Deuteronomy 14, we discover that uh, tithing, uh, the tithe was to be eaten before the Lord. And then he said, and so now he's about to give the location as to what, uh, where it's supposed to be. He says, in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, which was Jerusalem. So the food was to be eaten before the Lord, the tithe. Then, it, then he goes into describing the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. So this is tying directly to what Leviticus was talking about. It's about food and animals. That's what the tithe was applied to. He said that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But then in verse 24, he says, but if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe. So notice now there's there's an implication that there is a an issue, right? He, he creates this problem scenario. What if the, the journey from where you live all the way to Jerusalem is too long for you to carry the tithe? So, for example, many individuals had great herds and great flocks. Imagine if somebody had a huge farm and huge farmland and their 10% was like thousands of pounds. There is no way that they're going to be able to take that and carry it all the, all the way to Jerusalem. So God creates, shows you this problem scenario, and then he's going to tell you how to solve it. And I think this is what's very important. He says, but if the journey is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your, choose, uh, your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. And this is very important because he just showed you that the tithe is not money because you have to exchange the tithe for money. Okay, very important. Then he says, take the money in your hand and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses. Now, some people take this passage in CC. Well, we don't have animals, uh, so now we have to give money. But that's not what the text is saying, because look what happens with the tithe um, after it's converted to money. And he says in verse 26, and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires. So some people say, oh, you see, whatever you can spend this money on whatever you want. But no, he then he gives you the kind of framework or the stipulation as to what the tithes are supposed to cover. He says for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice you and your household. So now what happens is they had all these crops and animals. They converted it to money in order to go over to Jerusalem. Then they take that money. Do you think that they give the money to the priests? No, they're not giving the money to the priests. They then buy the food that is required for the feast days and things like that and convert and they convert the money back to food so they can eat it before the Lord. 
verse 27, um, it says, you shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. So you see the tithe was for the Levites to take care of them and to make sure that they had enough to eat. So immediately we see the tithe in Deuteronomy 14 is actually separated from money completely. Money. So, man, that that is a good, a great, great breakdown of the text of how we're supposed to look at how we need to be tied and what tied actually is. But who were the people that were tithing? Was it just those people who had flocks, herds, and grains? What about the people who were, you know, <laughs> metal workers or the women that had to that deliver the children? So what did other people have to do who w- didn't have their hands like on the field and had these flocks and herds because having flocks and herds are not cheap. Right. I, mean, I think when we, we live in a way, so we think, okay, like everybody had, you know, herds, sheep, cattle, everybody. Did. Right. So who were the people that were given those tithes? Was it just the ones who had the herds, the flocks, or what about the metal workers? Did they have to give a tithe? No. And that's the interesting part. The metal workers, the blacksmiths, the coppersmiths, how are they going to give a tithe if the tithe is not dealing with money? It's dealing specifically with food and crops. So if you were an individual who made your living by uh, making swords, making plows and things like that, or making instruments like that, you're, you couldn't give of a herd or flock if you didn't have it. Now, these individuals who were blacksmiths and coppersmiths and did different things, they would give offerings and they would give contributions, right? Financial contributions to the Levites for the upkeep of the temple, but all of them were offerings and none of them was re- none of them were required to give 10% of their earnings. Again, these are all free will offerings that they were giving to uh the the Levites specifically. Right, right. And I think man, I think I really missed something. I messed up. I missed something. We- I think we need to go back to, because the claim is always made. This is where it first started off. Well, for me, in my experience, it's the same thing that the Sabbath issue deals with, that God mm-hmm. ordered and established the Sabbath before the law was given. Right. And tithe was established because of Melchizedek before the law was given. So mm-hmm. can we go to that Genesis passage and talk <laughs> about that? Because it really, it really irks me. I'm like, no, nah, that's not what it's talking about. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think we can go there. I think that that would be fun. Oh yeah, definitely. So the two main passages that are usually brought up when it comes to tithing, because once they understand that tithing was required at the law of Moses, and we know that we're no longer under the law, some individuals try to go before the law of Moses and, Moses and try to establish tithing. And that's not the case. And the two passages that are usually used are Genesis chapter 14 and Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 14 deals with Abraham and Melchizedek and Genesis chapter 28 deals with the vow that Jacob made. So number one, God never mandated tithing before the law of Moses. And that's extremely important to understand. Never in scripture before the law, uh, before the law of Moses was tithing mandated by God. And it's very important to understand that. Now, in Genesis chapter 14, we're going to deal with the Melchizedek and the Abraham issue, right? So in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, it reads, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now, immediately individuals say, you see, he gave 10% of everything that he had, but that's not true. He didn't give 10% of everything that he had. He gave 10% of a specific thing. Now, when you go to Hebrews chapter seven and verse four, it actually describes what he gave. And that was the spoils of war. So what did Abraham give? He gave Melchizedek 10% of the spoils of war. He didn't give 10% of all his herds, his flocks. He didn't give 10% of everything that he owned. He only gave 10% of the spoils of war and God didn't tell him to do it. It was of something that he wanted to do. Uh, so what's very important is that we can't take what Abraham did and then try to superimpose it onto everyone else as if it's a mandate when God didn't tell him to do that. That was something that he did out of his own free will. And that's dealing specifically with Abraham and Melchizedek. Again, 
There was the spoils of war, not everything that he owned. As some people would try to say, hey, he gave a tithe of everything that he had. But it was dealings, and this is why it's important to read the Bible in context, because when Hebrews chapter 7 and four, verse 4 actually describes what it is that he gave, now we understand, oh, it wasn't everything that he owned, but it was everything as far as the, the spoils of war that he got. And so that's dealing with the Abraham and Melchizedek issue. Right, man. Now, you, what you said was important. God did not mandate. He did not give Abraham a, a commandment to give mm-hmm. this 10 percent. So was this just a common practice around the um, ancient Near East where people would give 10 percent, you know, to a priest or to whoever like that other nations practice this? Because to me, it seemed that they had to practice this if God didn't command Abraham to give 10%. Abraham said, I don't think Abraham said, you know what, I'm just going to give, you know, just 10%. I think it was a culture thing that people were already giving 10% to mm-hmm. like priests or whoever. But even if the other nations, let's say the other nations didn't give 10%, right? right. That's like, like, for example, me and you have a conversation and let's say you, you bless me, right? We, we're talking about the word of God and, and you tell me something so important. It touches my soul. And I say, you know what, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars for my thousand dollar paycheck. Right. So that hundred dollars from the thousand dollar paycheck goes to you. Now, does that mean that it is a law? And does that mean that everybody after me has to do the same thing? No, it was something that I gave to you. So even if the other nations didn't practice it, right, even if it wasn't a cultural, even if it was a cultural thing, it was, again, a free will choice and offering here. And that's just dealing with uh, Melchizedek and Abraham, which is usually the first scripture that people go to to try to impose that. I think. And what happens is they try to jump. And once that doesn't work out, right, usually it's like, oh, okay, well, what about Jacob? Jacob made a vow to God. So how about that? And he says that he'll give him a tenth of everything that he owned. So let's let's look at that and let's just take the, the portion apart. Now, everything that I'm saying, I'm quoting verses because, of course, you know, just for the sake of brevity, we can't go through every single verse in the chapter. Right. But I would always advise people, go back. Don't just believe what I'm saying. Go back and read the entire context of the conversation so you can get a better understanding of what's going on always. So in Genesis chapter 28, right, verses 20 to 22 is where we have this conversation or this vow given by Jacob. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, And keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So here again is very important. Number one, who's making the vow? It's Jacob. God did not tell him to make this vow. This is of his own accord that he's doing this. But notice that Jacob is also putting stipulations on his giving. He says, if God will be with me and keep me in his way and give me bread and clothing, give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come to my father's house in peace. What does he do? Then the Lord shall be my God and the stone which I have set shall be God's house and everything that you give me, I'll give a 10th to you. So Jacob is making a vow to God saying that if you do these things, then I will give a 10th to you. So if we really want to apply the context, which I'm pretty sure no pastor or teacher or elder want to apply that context to it, where, for example, if I walk into the church and say, Hey, the only way I'm going to give a 10th to you is if I receive something from you. That's, that's contrary, right? So again, the conversation, notice again, it's the same thing as uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. The conversation is going one way. It's going between Jacob and to God. God did not tell Jacob, you have to give a 10th of everything that you own. So again, this is not a tithing law. It is not mandated by God. These are individuals doing this of their own free will. Right. If, if, if. Exactly. Now imagine if we had that. Yeah, like you said, we had that mentality. Okay, God, if God bless me, then I give. If right. the pastor <laughs> says what I like, then I give. If the choir plays the song that I like today, mm-hmm. then I would give. No, that's not the way it works. <laughs> not the exactly. way it works at all. That's that's just completely backwards. And so I want to um drive it back right fast when we were talking okay. about Melchizedek. And mm-hmm. when people use that, and they also use that Jacob passage as well, mm-hmm. saying like, okay, this was this happened before the law was given, but they had other practices before the law was given, like circumcision. And right. So I don't see no 
pastor saying that you have to be circumcised to be saved. I mean, that would clearly go against the New <laughs> Testament. And plainly go against right. the New Testament. I mean, you can just open up the New Testament and read that. It'll go against it. Our problem is you cannot use you cannot use a like you cannot use a text and say, you know what? Even though this was before the law, I'm going to use this and try to apply it, try to switch around and put it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, you definitely can do that. And so what happens is individuals are are stuck in this place. It's one of the hardest things for for some people to kind of comprehend and to get is that you can't take the old covenant and mingle it with the new covenant. Once you do that, you create a whole bunch of problems, right? Because a lot of individuals, even from the background I came from, it was about keeping the law of Moses, keeping all the commandments that you can. But what happens is you always leave something out and you fall short anyway. Uh, When you read uh, James and he says, you know, if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. This demonstrates that the law itself is one unit. Even though we describe it and explain it in different sections like dietary portion, uh, sacrificial system and things like that, it's still one unit. So, for example, if I offend, let's just say I was in the old covenant and let's say I didn't um, do the sacrifices, but I kept the Sabbath. I'm still guilty of breaking God's law because it's a unit together. So you can't separate it. But when you try to take the old covenant and put it into the new covenant, it's similar to like, let's just say me and you made a contract together. And let's say I broke the contract. So there's penalties I have to pay. And this is why Jesus Christ comes in to pay the penalty because Israel could not keep their side of the contract or keep their side of the agreement. But now let's say, okay, now that I pay, now that Jesus Christ paid the penalty, there's a new covenant given, which means that this new covenant is not like the first covenant. And that's what it says in scripture. This, they are two different covenants. Now there's a brand new set of stipulations as attached to us becoming righteous in God's sight. It is no longer the law, but now it is faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why it's important to make sure we understand the, uh, the distinction between the two covenants. Right, exactly. So I do want to move to the New Testament, but before we go to the New Testament, I mm-hmm. want you to talk about Proverbs um, 3, 9 through 10, because a lot of people bring that scripture up too when God, when he talks about honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruit of all your crops. So can you talk about that? Okay, so let me, I'm pulling it up right now. All right, so it says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Notice there are two verses and they are giving distinctions. Honor the Lord with your possessions. For example, with my house, I can honor the Lord with what I own. For example, if somebody needed a room to stay in for the night or they didn't have a place to stay, I can honor the Lord with what I have and take them in and make sure they're okay. But then notice that it goes from possessions and then he goes and with the first fruits of all your increase. And then now the first fruits were what first fruits of your increase are dealing with the 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 food and the crops again. Now, how do I know that? Am I just superimposing that into the text? And again, this is the old covenant or is does he give a description? Well, in verse 10, he says, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So again, the first fruits of your increase is the first fruits of what he's increasing in the field and in your crops. Remember, he's dealing with the children of Israel. If we take this and mean, okay, everything that you get as far as money goes, and you have to honor him with the first fruits of that, then this is, you're kind of uh, separating the text. Now, do I believe that Christians should honor God with their money, with their food, with their house, with their possessions. Yes. Everything that you do in your life is supposed to be reflective of God. Now, can you give money to the churches and can you give money to those who are in need? Absolutely. Honor God with your money. But this is not saying in the mandating that, okay, you have to give 10%. It's saying that you should behave in a manner that is in, in kind of in step with God's, with, with honoring God with everything that you have. So this is not a scripture that mandates tithing especially in the new covenant mm, yeah that's so good oh that, yeah that was good that was, that was good <laughs> that was good that now oh, it's another <laughs> that was good for real and it made me go want to go back to malachi again so i need we need to get to the new testament but just keep like i keep going back to the old <laughs> because that's what um a lot of people love to use 
And so when mm-hmm. we go back and look at Malachi, it talks about um, them um, robbing God, and he talk about God opening up the floodgates, bring everything into the storehouse, and then he will mm-hmm. open up the floodgates. And you were just talking about in Proverbs chapter 3, talking about honoring God with all your crops and all of that. So what is this storehouse? What is this um, floodgates <laughs> that the Lord is speaking of? He's actually talking about, okay, when you bring this 10% in, I will open up the heavens and you receive 10 million or a million <laughs> or 500,000 <laughs> or a new house. Not saying that people, I know people, I know it's a lot of stories people have tied and have given and have received from the Lord. I, I mm-hmm. believe that 100%. But that scripture is still used out of context a lot. So can you talk about what is the storehouse? What is the floodgates? And what are these pestilence that will the Lord will keep us from <laughs> devouring our wealth? Basically, you know, nowadays in modern times, these demons that will take away your money and wealth. What is the Lord right. actually talking about? Okay, so we definitely have to go back to Malachi. And so basically all of the information that we covered so far is from seven to about eight. (laughs) So we've covered two verses of information. So it shows you that it takes time to kind of dissect the text and understand the context. So we'll go from verse nine. Right. So now it says you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me the whole nation of you. So what is the curse? I think that's very important. Okay. And so let's deal with the curse specifically. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17, watch what he says here. Uh, also, um, you know what? Actually, uh, if you if if you know your listeners and you, you can write down Deuteronomy chapter 28 just as a as a as a reference. Now, in Deuteronomy 28, God gives blessings and cursings. If you obey me, you'll receive these blessings. If you disobey me, you'll receive these curses. And so in Deuteronomy 20, he's really just reiterating a lot of the things that he said earlier in the book of Deuteronomy or in Exodus. But let's deal with Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17 to kind of find out what it was that how he was going to curse Israel for their disobedience. Uh, So it says, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord, your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Right. So what is he saying? I'm going to bless your field and the animals that you have for, for, for obeying my commands. But then he says, take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. So now, now the disobedience comes, right? Individuals are serving other gods. According to Malachi, they're disrespecting God by giving him these bad and and blemished sacrifices. So what does he promise to do for their disobedience? He says, and uh, it says, lest the Lord's be, uh, lest the Lord's anger be roused against you. And he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain and the land and the land yield no produce And you perish quickly from the good land, which the Lord, your God is giving you. So that's the curse. If you don't obey me, I'm going to mess up your crops and your food and your animals, and you're not going to have enough. Now, why is that important? Right now, going into this verse 10, it says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Now, is the storehouse a place of like, is it a treasury or Is it a place where the food is collected? Well, if we continue reading in the text, this says that there may be what in my house? Money or food? It says food specifically in Malachi 3 and verse 10. So he's saying bring everything that you're supposed to bring, the 10% of the crops and the animals so that there be enough food in the storehouses. And then he says, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, And pour you a blessing until there is no more need. The windows of heaven, you can think about as the sky and the rain falling from heaven in order to water the crops and the fields. So he's saying, if you bring your 10%, I'm going to keep my promise that I did in Deuteronomy chapter 11. When I said, if you honor me, I'm going to bless your fields. And and it says, uh, again, I'll read the the portion in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, verse 13. Uh, It says, uh, and I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain. This is the blessing that's coming from heaven to water their crops and their fields. 
Uh, And he says, until there is no more need. So I'm going to give you plenty of rain. Then he says in verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you. Now, this is kind of like what you alluded to earlier is, are these demons out there taking your money and, and doing all this stuff? Is that what the text is saying? Well, no. If you think about the term devourer, if you go back into let's say Exodus, right? When the children of uh, Israel were trapped in Egypt, what did God send to devour the things in the field? He sent locusts and things like that. So that's the devourer. The devourer is not some demon that comes and takes money out of your wallet, out of your bank account, or causes your your car to break down. And now you get a speeding ticket. That's the Lord. That's not what it's about. (laughs) The context here is dealing specifically with locusts that come and devour your crops. And he says, I will rebuke. In other words, I will keep them at bay. I will keep them from devouring your crops. Then he said, then he tells you, what they do, right? In verse 11, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, uh, shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And then he says, then all the nations will call you blessed. Why? Because the devourer or these locusts or these pests will not come and devour the food and they will have plenty. So the other nations will look at these people specifically dealing with the children of Israel. Again, we have to keep that in context. It's not talking to you, right? It's not, it's not saying, Hey, if you do this in your field, this is no, he's talking to the children of Israel. He says, then all nations will call you blessed. Why? Because you have plenty of crops and nothing is devoured. So the devourer are pests and locusts that come, they usually devour the crops. So that's what Malachi chapter three is dealing with specifically. Bomb drop. Now, now we can move. Now we can move <laughs> to the New Testament. And now we can move to the New Testament, man. Oh my goodness. This has been so good. Um, SOC, because I know a lot of people need to hear this especially with the so-called stimulus and everybody getting all this money. Right. And I know <laughs> people are saying, hey, you have to set aside that 10%. I mean, there's nothing wrong with setting aside 10%. Mm-hmm. I think it makes you know how to manage money and know how to be more diligent with your money. But people mostly who are struggling and can barely give 5% have to give, you know, 10%, almost their whole paycheck to right. their local church. And sometimes that can be extremely dangerous. But it goes back into this and we all know who the authority is for our salvation and for our lives, especially for the Bible. It's the man, Christ Jesus. And when you use Jesus, anytime Jesus says something it's extremely important. Okay. Right. Anytime he says something, we have to take heed to it. And so they would use Jesus when he confronted the Pharisees and told them, you know what? You should have, um, practice the okay, okay I'm, I'm i don't want to mess up the um scripture i would have to bring it up i can't just quote it off the top of my head but you know the script i'm talking about i think it's in um matthew 23 if i'm not um yeah matthew 20, 23 and 23 i pulled it up right so <laughs> that that verse thank you soc shout out to yeah, no. <laughs> but having my back but yeah they use that verse and say hey yeah jesus spoke about the tide he said hey, yeah keep doing this this is good you should be tithing but you have to worry about the other things of the law too but make sure that you tithe though so can we definitely can you can you break down that scripture for us Okay, so in Matthew chapter 23 and 23, this scripture is usually used to say, hey, Jesus Christ enforces tithing in the New Testament. The problem is that's not what the text is dealing with. But let's let's read 23 and 23 and kind of explain what it is that's happening here. So it says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. So who is Jesus speaking with? He's speaking to the Pharisees. He's not speaking to everybody, the other nations. He's not speaking to Gentiles. He's not speaking to people after the cross. He's speaking to the Pharisees. He say, you give a tenth, notice a a tithe. So what are they giving a tenth of? Is it money? Even here in this text, it actually shows you what the tithe is. He says, you give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Okay, so this text is usually used to say, hey, listen, you see, Jesus just said that he should, that they should tithe, but they also shouldn't neglect the weightier matters of the law. Now, here's the thing. Understand what point Jesus is saying this. Number one, is this before his death or after his death? This is after, this is before his death, right? Jesus hadn't yet died. 
He was not crucified. He hasn't raised from the dead. So, of course, he's going to tell the Pharisees to keep the law because they still have to abide by that until the death of Christ uh, before he comes and he dies for the sacrifices of the people. Now, again, when you look at this text, he's also saying uh, you should uh, the tenth of your spices. Now, again, I wanted to highlight that portion because I think it's important that he didn't say a tenth of all of your income. He said a tenth, the tenth of your spices. So the Pharisees were very stringent when it came to the law, or at least tried to be stringent. So not only did they tithe of the, 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 the animals and the flocks and the fields, but they went all the way down to the spices, salt, pepper, mint, dill, cumin, all of these spices. And they're saying they're straining at trying to do that and they're they're neglecting the things that actually you know the weightier matters of the law again i think what people do is they take this to try to say that we're supposed to keep the law but if that's the case if jesus is saying to keep the law right and we have to keep the tithing law then that means also in other scriptures in the new testament when he tells the pharisees to take your gift before the priest then that means we actually have when we have a, a difficulty with our brother or sister we actually have to go give a gift to a priest but guess what The temple is no longer standing. So that means the things that were applied to before the cross of Christ are not applied after the cross of Christ or after Jesus died. So this text cannot be used to say that we have to tithe because Jesus is not telling people after the cross or under the new covenant to tithe. He's dealing with Pharisees who are currently under the law before his death. And that's what I think is important to look at in that text specifically. Right, exactly what you said. Like, we have to go give something to a priest. If that same context, like when Jesus clinched the man and told him to go offer um, the things that most are prescribed in the law. So when we say somebody mm-hmm. get healed, they have to offer something to a priest or to their pastor or to their bishop. No, you don't have to do those things. Right. So now this goes back to giving to pastors, <laughs> okay? Because the text is used when they gather everything up in Acts chapter 4, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So when you bring home your money, whether it's your, um, some people will say tie from your net, tie from your gross, but when you bring home your income, make sure you bring it in and basically lay it at their church's feet. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's not the context of what's going on here, right? So when he said, and, and you know, I know it's controversial to a lot of people, like, what? No, well, think about it. Number one, it was dealing with the apostles and with the church there. Now, what were they doing? Did, did the apostles tell them, hey, you guys got to give 10% to us. You have to tithe. Is that what they're doing? No. This was a free will offering from the people. The people decided, hey, instead of all of us suffering lack, how about all of us give what we can, a free will offering to the apostles, and then have the apostles, what, distribute the money back out. So you see, it was not about tithing, but rather a redistribution of the, the riches so that everybody would be happy. So if let's just say the, the church wanted to apply that specifically and ultimately, what that would mean is everybody who gives a tithe into the church or gives 10 percent or gives money to the church, any free will offerings, the money that didn't stay with the apostles, they didn't keep it for themselves. They went and redistributed the money back out. So, again, this is not a tithing scripture. This is talking about everybody giving a free will offering of their own accord. Notice nowhere did it say that they gave 10 percent. It was a free will offering. That is like, for example, let's just say me, you and a couple of other brothers and sisters in Christ lived in this community. And we decided, hey, instead of one of us being rich, how about we all collect a certain amount of money? You give what you can and then redistribute the money back out. So everybody has enough. That's all that happened there. Uh, So we can't say, okay, that's talking about the church. Because that's not the church that it wasn't dealing with that specifically. It was and it wasn't tithing. It was a free will offering that they chose to give. Right, right, right. I definitely agree with that 100 percent. Now we go into first Corinthians 16, verse one through three, when Paul is talking about, OK, gather all your income for the first so he can come collect it. So make sure and we know, OK, we know now Sunday is the first day of the week. So make sure you gather that check up. Put that ten percent, and make sure you have it there on Sunday morning. <laughs> 
Now, this has nothing to do with that. Now, what he's doing is he's collecting money for a specific purpose. And notice that he says, let me see, let's actually, you know what, 16, let's go uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And it talks about the collection for the saints. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, and now remember, this is talking about a specific moment in time. Each of you is to put something aside. Notice he didn't say 10% aside. He said something aside and store it up as he may prosper. In other words, as you are able, as, as much as you can, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So basically he's telling, hey, listen, I'm coming to you guys. You know, every Sunday from here on out, from when you receive this letter, make sure you guys take up your collections and put them together so that when I come there, you guys don't have to run and hurry up and try to figure out how to get all the money together. Just go ahead and work ahead of time. So that way. And, and then what does he do with? He says, and when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift where to Jerusalem. So basically he's making a collection for saints in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was dealing with a lot of persecution, a lot of difficult situations, um, So what he did was he asked the other churches, hey, you know, before I get there, make sure you guys collect all the money you can. So when I get there, you don't have to collect it. And that way you don't have to, you know, basically dealing with things in, in, you know, in order. So that way, hey, when I get there, I don't have to collect it. And that way you can bring it back. Now, this is this is what he was talking about. This wasn't talking about every single service. He was talking about until I get there, collect so that way I can take it to Jerusalem. Um, And uh, notice and, and I know I highlighted this part, but I think it's important to look at. He said, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, not 10 percent of what you own, not 10 percent. He said something. In other words, give what you can, something he didn't specify. So some people might have given, let's just say, five hundred dollars. Another group might have been able to give two thousand dollars. Other people might have been able to give 50 or 10. So he said, put something aside and then collect it all together so I could take it to Jerusalem. So, yeah, this is not saying that every church service we're supposed to collect 10 percent of everybody's paycheck. Because if we were doing <laughs> and that's what we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, continuing with this tide and it's nothing i'm not saying don't hide at all but i would like i don't even like the name if i if i right that was me i would just say you can do an offering or just give i don't know why it's so hard to just say just give or you don't have to force someone to give that's the problem so i want to um i think i want to tackle one more scripture one more passage and then um i got a couple questions for you now um, Second Corinthians, um, chapter nine. That that's um, this that's a good chapter. I mean, I like the book of Corinthians. I think sometimes it can be kind of difficult for some people to understand. And some, I mean, just to understand, probably in general. But I I want to go there. And have how Paul talks about giving. It's not the way that we present giving, right? All right. So, you know, I'm the kind of guy who likes walking through the whole chapter, but I'm going to uh, pick on a few a few points. So, number one, I would ask everybody listening to read the entire chapter of first Corinthians, second uh, Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter nine. But now he's talking about cheerful giving. And I think this is where the church needs to really kind of reflect. Notice nowhere in the text that he says, give 10 percent. And, and that's what you're supposed to give. Notice he doesn't say that nowhere where it talks about being a cheerful giver. And that's very important. As a matter of fact, just so the audience knows, I would challenge anybody out there to find one verse in the New Testament that mandates tithing under the new covenant. You're not going to find that one verse. Now, if this was so important as far as for your salvation, honoring God, of course, we, we would think that, hey, Paul would talk about it. The apostles would talk about it, say, hey, you have to give 10%. But not one apostle, not one, not one teacher of the, the word of God in the, new co- in the New Testament or in the New Covenant mandate tithing. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, we'll start at verse 6. Uh, he says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. I, I'm sorry. I have to. Feel, I feel like I have, we have to go through the chapter. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. We can definitely go through the chapter. I'm, I'm open to it. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> okay, because it just feels like, you know, taking different pieces, it'll really just kind of mess it up. Okay. So he says, now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. Basically, it's just kind of, a, it, it, I don't even need to write to you about the ministry of the saints. For I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, 
saying that Achaia has been ready since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. So what he's saying here in this first portion is, listen, I already know you guys have been ready to give for a long time. I don't even have to boast or write about how much you want to give. Verse three, but I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter so that you may be ready as I said you would be. So he's saying here, I, I don't want your, I don't want us to just boast about how much you want to give. So I'm sending this letter ahead of time so we can be prepared. Verse four, otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So, hey, listen, let's not be humiliated. Let's not be embarrassed because I already said that you guys want to give and I know you guys want to give. Verse five, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you and arrange in advance for the gift You have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. So notice he says it's not as an exaction. It is a willing gift. So it's not something I'm prying out of you. It's something that you are willing to give. So when you have time to plan, you are more you are giving more out of your want and your desire. But if somebody comes and tries to compel you and let's say I arrived at your house tomorrow and say, hey, give me one hundred dollars. You're going to feel compelled. There's not going to be a free will offering. It's going to just feel like pressure. So this is what he's telling them. Hey, just be prepared. So that way, you know, you give what you want. And then he says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, people will take this and say, hey, the more money you give, the more blessings you get. The The least amount of money you give, the least amount of blessings you get. But this is not what he's talking about here. And the reason you have to kind of you have to read the entire context of the chapter to understand what is what is being bountifully. In other words, what is being increased as a result of your giving? So verse seven, he says, each one must give as he has who as he has decided in his heart. So that means the decision is up to you how much you give. But then he says, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Now, of course, unfortunately, with the prosperity preachers and things like that that are going out there, people are giving under compulsion because they feel pressured to give. And this is actually different from what's happening here. Then he says, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. Now, if you give, you know, if you take the time to say, hey, this is my budget, this is what I can give. I'm going to set this aside for the Lord. You're going to be happy to give it because you have you decided it, you 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 thought it out. You prayed with the Lord and you asked him, what what is it that you're able to give? And you're making that decision between you and him. Verse eight. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work as it is written. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So now verse 10, he goes, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, again, we we're trying to get to the point where what is it that we are going to reap bountifully? Right. Because it's always talked about the more money you sow, the more money you get or the more blessings you get. But dealing with the context, the sowing and and the reaping here is not dealing with finances or even personal blessing specifically is dealing with a blessing for the church as a whole, the increase of the church. So let's, let's see that in verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So what is he talking about? The money that they're sowing into the ministry to help the people in, to help the churches that they're giving this money to is going to overflow in thanksgivings to God. In other words, because you gave to the people who need it, they're going to praise the Lord and thank God. So your giving actually caused people to praise the Lord, right? And not only that, but it supplied all their needs. Verse 13, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for what? His inexpressible gift. So I know we went through that whole chapter, but you understand that the sowing and the reaping, basically it's like, if me and you decide to sow into a ministry to help a church in Asia 
And what happens is they get that money. Not only does it bless them by giving them the things that they need, but it also blesses them in that they're uh, crying out to God and thanking him. So that is what you're reaping. The fact that you've invested into the ministry of God and caused others to glorify God. So what you gave actually resulted in a bountiful blessing. Mm, man, SOC. Man, you've dropping some bombs. Some bombs <laughs> tonight. No lie, you really are. That um, is amazing. I thank you for going through that um, passage, even though you went through it kind of quickly. I know we didn't have enough time to like. Yeah, I just didn't want to take too long. <laughs> I know. I know you like to break down the text like verse by verse by verse. And, and that's um, beautiful. It's amazing. So I do thank you for that. So I, so how can we change the mindsets of people when they come into church? Like, how can we shift this um, narrative of that you have to give like you have to like it's a must because when something is a must you have to do it and when you don't do it it seems like a burden over your head so Mm -hmm. how can we change that narrative well one of the things that i always say is to teach the truth of scripture and if you don't teach the truth of scripture individuals are not going to comprehend and know why they're doing certain things Um, uh, So the first thing is teach the truth of scripture. This is how you kind of give people more confidence in the word of God, because the more you understand something, the more you're able to kind of live up to its standards or live in a way that is in, in step with Christ. The second thing people need to do, um, whether it's pastors, teachers, or leaders is live out what you claim um, without hypocrisy. Okay, and I think that's important, too, because if, for example, if you tell people, oh, you have to give 10 percent and you have to do this. Number one, I I agree with you in the beginning because you stated that tithe is a word. I think that I agree with you in that I believe the word tithe does not need to be used at all anymore because it has too much implications tied to the old covenant law. So we should not be using the word tithe in churches. That's my opinion. I believe that we not we should not use it unless we're using it in conjunction with the old covenant and describing that. Uh, we have to, I believe that Christians, teachers, leaders, pastors should be using the word offering, specifically if you want to free will offering, give what you can according to the Lord. Now, I think the truth of that, of truth of this message that we've been speaking so far, I truly believe that a lot of people are going to be wanting to give more. Why? Because they're not being compelled and pressured to give. And notice that when some individuals say things like, well, you have to give 10%. What if a person is not able to give 10%, but they're able to give five? Well, here's what happens. They're not going to give the 5% of what they can because the 10% is the bare minimum, or at least that's what's being stated in the churches. Right. But if you tell people, hey, listen, give what you can and the Lord is going to bless you for whatever you give, then people are going to be like, hey, I I can I can give five dollars. I can give ten. I can give twenty. I can give one hundred. I can give nine percent. I can give eight percent. I can give fifteen percent. I can give twenty. Whatever percent people now they're free to give as much as they can. And they don't feel that if they don't give 10 percent, they're not going to be blessed. And number and the next thing uh, I think churches can do is, number one, people people want to support a ministry that is doing good. Right. People are compelled by love to give to a ministry that is helping. Let me give you an example. If you think about, um, let's just say different um, charities, right? The Cancer Research, uh, St. Jude's Children's Hospital uh, and different charities like that. None of them come up to your door and say you are mandated to give 10 percent to our charities. But yet and still, they have so much money coming in that they're able to take care of their employees. They have enough money to take care of all the kids in the hospitals where the parents don't have to pay. And so the people keep donating. Do you know why people keep donating? Because they see that their money isn't being misused, but rather is being used for good. Now, if people in the church saw that individuals like like pastors and teachers and leaders were using the money to go back into the communities to help the sick, help the poor, take care of the people in the church, people would be giving so much because they see that their money is being used wisely. And that is what I think would give so much people confidence in giving to the church. If people were just taught the truth and then allowed to see the fruit, their fruit of their labor going to do good things. Right. And it's kind of hard to um, even teach the truth because it's to me, I think it does have uh, some, I think it does do some mental damage when you tell someone that they have to give 10% and they don't have the 10% mm-hmm. to give. And I'm not a psychologist and then, but I think it does <clears throat> do some mental damage and they might go home. Cause you, you tell them that they're cursed and they're not blessed by God. And 
God would not show his favor or love on them. And in, in my in my head, I think that some people start to act out those actions in their lives. Mm-hmm. Not so much that they're not giving 10%, but maybe they become lazy. Maybe they stop looking for a job because you know what? I'm not blessed by God. I'm cursed I, because I can't give. He doesn't love me. He doesn't, I mean, I don't love God enough to even get 10% to give him. So, you know what? I'm crap right now. So right. how can we like that? That is, that is dangerous. That is like, to me, that is abuse to me. I don't know how else you can put it. That's just my opinion. I think that is a form of spiritual abuse. It is a form of spiritual abuse. And let me tell you why, because it's distorting the character of God is changing God in people's eyes. Um, number one, it creates a false expectation in a relationship, right? For example, people will say, well, if you give God 10%, he'll bless you. But here's the problem. People have been giving 10% for many years. Now, somebody might come with a story and say, oh, I gave this and then I was blessed. But now let's take that story and let's multiply the individuals who did give and didn't receive. Now you're going to see a bigger number than just, oh, you know, there's one or two people that that stood up in the church, right? You're going to see a whole church of individuals stand up and say, hey, I gave 10%. And I'm still struggling with my bills. I'm still struggling with finances. And what ends up happening is people say, well, you're not managing your money right. Well, that's not always the case. Some people just don't have that much to give. And so what happens is they have this expectation that God is supposed to give me money when I give him money. And when it doesn't happen, they don't look at the person or the pastor who told them the lie, but rather they look at God and say, God, you didn't do what you promised to do. And God is like, well, I didn't tell you that I'm going to give you everything you want, right? So this is a scripture I think we we need to, to keep in mind is in Matthew chapter 16, verses 19 through 21. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So when you're giving to the church or you're giving to a ministry, your goal isn't to receive money because you are supposed to be storing up riches in heaven. That is like a lot of people have this, you know, live your best life now. Well, if you live your best life now, How are you really going to live your best life later when you're with Christ? That's what's important. That's I mean, I actually made a T-shirt that said that live your best life later, you know, with the scripture attached to it, because I think it's important for us to look at things through an eternal perspective rather than a temporal or earthly perspective. So when you sow into a ministry, you may not get any money back or you may not get any so-called riches or or, uh, promotions or whatever it is you're looking for. But if your motivation is to invest into the kingdom of God, then that's the key. You're like, okay, my investment is for later. It's, it's, it's similar to when people invest in stocks and, 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 and dividends, right? They're trying to invest a certain amount of money so that they can have a return maybe a year or two later. For us, we're making the investment, but we're not going to receive on that investment until the return of Christ when we inherit the kingdom of God with Christ. And again, the reason why people are going through depression and and suffering is because they think that they aren't meeting God's standard. They're basically putting being put under a form of legalization or law keeping. And that's exactly what it is. You're bringing the law into the new covenant, which is tithing. Tithing is a law under the old covenant. The moment you bring it into the new covenant, people have to meet the standard. When they don't meet the standard or can't meet the standard, immediately they have this fear that God doesn't love them. And that really causes a whole lot of what you were talking about earlier, a lot of mental and psychological abuse. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. This is, this is, this has been, this has been real good. This has been real good. Now I have one more question before we leave. Cause I don't want to take up all your time. Cause I know it's, it's getting <laughs> late and I know you probably got some stuff to do, right? You got to wipe the tent too and things <laughs> like that. So, but I, I, I really, this goes back to the old Testament and the law. Why do we separate all the other laws and use the law of tithe. We don't use no other law in the old Testament. Really try to try to like establish it and say, Hey, this is what you must do. Like this is a must almost like believing in Christ's resurrection is a must. <laughs> That's what tithing is. It's a must like that. So why do we use that old Testament law? Not the other old Testament law. Why is that? Old Testament law is so compelling. I know it probably because of money. I think that's probably <laughs> that's the reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, right. That that is the reason. 
Right. So like, okay, so the reason like, so why is tithing applied to the new covenant and not the rest of the Old Testament law pretty much? So what happens is the Old Testament law requires a lot of work, right? But then it also applies to everybody, right? So if you start again, this is why it's important not to take the old covenant and superimpose it into the new covenant, because then you're adding a whole bunch of requirements. But here's the reason why I think tithing specifically is done. There are a couple of reasons. Number one, I think tithing is taught today. um, And again, remember, tithing is 10% of flocks and animals. But in the new covenant, well, not in the new covenant, in the church nowadays, they're taking the word tithing and applying it to money. Now, the reason why this is done is, number one, it could be ignorance. You just don't know better, right? Uh, The second thing is tradition. This is what has been taught for a long time. People have just kind of accepted this and have not really dug into the scriptures to find out what tithing is about. Uh, The third reason is greed, Right. There are a lot of prosperity pastors and they're just trying to garner money. So they'll twist and 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 destroy as much scripture as they can in order to, you know, manipulate people to give. And so the reason why people uh, do that is because now here now the reason why people do that, again, is for greed and to, to just garner money for themselves. But there's also another reason that I think that a lot of people don't talk about. And it's the fact that some pastors, leaders and teachers who actually understand this but are afraid to teach the congregation because they're not trusting God to support their ministry. They're trusting people. And I think that's the issue, right? Because if you trust the Lord, if your, if your ministry is of the Lord, somebody's lack of giving is not going to destroy the ministry. The Lord can easily bring somebody to come and give and, and, and support the ministry. The Lord will always provide for those who are teaching his truth and his word. So I think a lot of it is out of fear. Right. I've heard stories and and not personally, but I've heard stories of individuals talking to pastors and say, hey, you know, that tithing is not. And they're like, yeah, I know. And I get it. But if I tell my congregation this, they're going to stop giving. And that right there is demonstrating a lack of faith on that leader's part because he's relying on the people and he's not relying on God. God will always supply for those who need it and and are doing his work in the ministry. And if you teach, I get, I'm telling you, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I do it with all the love I can muster. If you teach people the truth of this, they're going to give more because it's going to be out of love. And they're going, they're not going to say, well, since I can't give 10%, I won't give the 5%. I'll just keep it for myself. Instead, they're going to give the 5% because they know that that is being honored by God. And that is what's so important. If somebody's able to give a dollar and they know that the Lord honors that, they're going to want to give more and more and more because they know that the Lord is honoring them and is with them and is not cursing them for their lack of giving. Now, I am not saying that people in the church, for example, pastors and teachers and leaders who work shouldn't be paid. I believe they should be compensated to the scripture in first Timothy chapter five and verse 18, it says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. I believe every pastor and teacher and leader who's doing the work of the Lord should be compensated for the work that they do. So I'm in total support of that. I'm also in total support of individuals giving as much as they possibly can to churches that are actually exercising the scriptures correctly and being ministers into helping other people. So yes, I'm for giving. A lot of people say once you, oh, I don't believe that tithing is for today. They're automatic response is, well, you don't believe in giving. And it's actually quite the opposite. I believe in giving as much as you possibly can. And, you know, for the purpose of uh, increasing God's ministry throughout and, you know, just increasing uh, the word of God and flowing through all nations. So we should give as much as we can, but don't feel that if you don't give 10%, that God is not going to honor what you can give. Amen. 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 Man, thank you. SOC man for taking time out to come on the show. Also, man, shout out to the live crowd. <laughs> okay, we really, we really don't have a live crowd, but I do <laughs> thank you, um, SOC, for coming on and talking about this topic. So, how can people find your work? Where can people get connected with you? And what you got coming up for us, man? Um, well, uh, well, as you stated earlier at the beginning of the of the podcast. Uh, I do have two ministries I'm running online. The main one, if you go to youtube.com, Servant of Christ Ministries, that's my main YouTube channel where I do all the video, the Bible videos and, and live teachings. Every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I do live Bible studies. Uh, currently, we are, as a matter of fact, in the book of Malachi right now. We just finished 
chapter one last night. So that's there for you to watch. And it's in a playlist. And then next week we'll do chapter two and then the next one, three and four. Um, I also have a channel called real reviews with S O C M as in ministry. And what we do there is we look at film from a Christian perspective. We look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of film. And we show people how to use those films to communicate with maybe unbelievers who may not be interested in the Bible, but they're interested in film and how you can use the different kind of themes and illusions in there and kind of point them to Christ by using the stories in those films. So again, the name of the channel is called real reviews and it's R E E L and then reviews with S O C M as in ministry and make sure you guys go and subscribe there. Uh, as far as what's coming up down the line, um, Again, a lot of new Bible studies. I'm working on a couple of videos. Uh, one of the uh, videos that I have actually coming out tomorrow at around 2 p.m. is a video dealing with the social media dangers that the Christian face, that the Christian churches and Christian content creators and anybody on social media are actually facing and how uh, digital discipleship can be helpful if understood accurately um, and understanding that discipleship is not something you do over the internet, but it's something that you do in person. But online teaching is very good for people who don't have access maybe to good solid Bible teaching churches. So that video is coming out tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Thank you SOC for coming on the show. Hopefully we can have you on again, probably talk about, uh, I mean, I feel like he's solid. <laughs> he's solid in all the topics y'all. Okay. He's solid in every single topic you could talk I'm about. I'm still learning, bro. I'm still learning. The Bible. This dude is solid, man. I thank you SOC for coming on. I thank you guys for tuning in. So just make sure you just keep thinking, man, keep asking, keep asking these questions, man. And plus, if you are struggling with this tie thing, go to SOC's page. I'm going to have the video right here somewhere on the screen that you can go take a look at because that <laughs> is a great great video it's a, it's like to me it's like a short almost like a short film but not a short film but it's like a, it's like a mini documentary right. it's like an hour and like 12 or 13 minutes just walking through tithing from old testament to new testament and it's amazing i promise you will learn a lot from that so man once again thank you soc it was an honor to have you on man and thanks thank for having me man for tuning in man y'all be blessed and just enjoy the rest of your day night whenever you're watching this <laughs> replay the day. just have a great time in christ enjoy your freedom in christ not your freedom to sin but your freedom in christ amen y'all later